Good morning, everyone. Uh, I believe we're going to start. We're still waiting of our, for our remote participant, but uh, he might join us as we start with introductions. Um, so my name is Sandra Cortesi. I'm the director of the Youth and Media Project at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. If you were expecting someone else here, I'm basically a last minute replacement for someone that couldn't be here today, but I hope you're going to be happy with my moderation. Um, the topic of today, uh, the title is basically Unleash the Power of Digital Economy and Society with Mobile Internet. Uh, looking at my colleagues that, are gonna uh, that I will introduce in a second, I think the aim for this session is to, we, I mean this is the day three of IGF, no? so we have heard and spoken a lot. Uh, particularly yesterday I was in a really interesting session looking at social innovation in the Global South uh, and we talked a lot about different examples, uh, challenges and opportunities using digital technology from AI to mobile phones uh, and I think what the goal today is and Patrick and his colleagues who actually organized the session is to also get a sense from you what you have observed over the last year or so and particularly looking at positive applications or use cases using digital technology. Although we're all going to also touch upon some of the challenges we have observed particularly this year, uh, we want to get a sense from you where you see opportunities uh, and positive use cases. So I hope that makes so far so good sense to all of you. 
Um, so quickly to, my, to the two interventionists or panelists that are here. Uh, and Stephen has joined them. Ah, Stephen has joined. That's awesome. So the three panelists and interventionists that we have um, here today. Uh, on my very left, first, I have um, Patrick Nomensen, who is representing the private sector as a U.S. E EU public policy manager for ByteDance. Um, next to him is uh, Caroline Jean-Marie, actually here based in France. Uh, she is representing civil society, is an AI policy researcher at the recently last year, I believe, incubated uh, think tank called the AI Initiative of the Future Society, a think tank incubated at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And remote participation, this is actually my first one, so I'm really excited. I hope technology doesn't fail us, uh, is Stephen Mavutur Dankor, representing the technical community, joining remotely from Ankara in Ghana. So I'm really excited about um, the, the session. It's going to go as following. I would love to hear who you are. Just quickly, if you could introduce yourself uh, with name and say uh, where you work or where you're coming from. And then I have three questions for uh, the fellow panelists here. So we're going to use uh, most of the other sessions that I was in was intervention after intervention after intervention. So this time we're going to give three questions so the, the, the people on the panel are going to respond quickly and then the next question and responding quickly. I hope so far that makes sense to you. So if we could start just with a very quick introduction and uh, I don't know if we want to start with Lionel who volunteered to be the online moderator, also very last minute colleague of mine. Thank you. I'm coming uh, from uh, University of Casablanca, Morocco. I have some interest in technical aspects uh, like uh, IPv6, uh, cyber security, and some other tech like this. Hi, I'm Pietro Desideri, and I work as a consultant here at UNESCO in the communication information sector. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Sasaki. I'm from uh, Japanese Ministry. Uh, Seto. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm from the Ministry of Public and Social Good morning. I'm Patrick Kondo. I'm the author of the Zimbabwe uh, uh, Freedom House, uh, Freedom on the Head Report. Uh, I work for the National Media Support. I'm Daniel, I support as 
Wonderful, thank you so much for these introductions. Um, so as I mentioned uh, before, uh, I have three questions for my colleagues here on this panel. Um, and so maybe we start with uh, Caroline. So the first question that I had for the three of you, that I have for the three of you is, what do you do and what does your organization do? And what's the biggest takeaway from 2018? Thank you. Hi, good morning everyone. So I'm Caroline Jean-Mer. I work uh, for the Future Society. I'm an AI policy researcher. So the Future Society is an AI and policy governance think tank that was originally incubated at Harvard Kennedy School. And um, we uh, shape the governance, we aim to shape the governance of AI while enabling um, positive, beneficial innovations, but still mitigating the downside risks from emerging technologies and AI. So uh, we do so with and for international organizations, national governments, corporations, um, nonprofit, and more. So um, we pursue our mission with research, convenings, as well as moonshot projects, uh, special governance projects, um, advisory, and executive education. So um, my biggest takeaway from 2018, like looking at all what happened with emerging technologies um, this past year, like the largest events, is the dire need for more cooperation and trust in um, governance of emerging technologies. So, we are um, in an AI and emerging technologies revolution. And because it's unprecedented in scale and in rapidity, but um, doing so, we are kind of a, on a rocket ship uh, together, um, aiming for beneficial future. But in order for us to steer toward this uh, beneficial future, we definitely need uh, coordination as well as like, pragmatism. So, um, so this kind of convenings here at IGF is necessary with like, as we heard, different stakeholders. So academics, governments, corporations, but we need much more of them uh, because we need trust. So we organized the US-China AI Tech Summit in California last June. And um, we saw the massive innovations happening in China and happening around the world in the US as well what we really saw is that it's possible to find common grounds in applications of technology. So um, AI and healthcare, mobile, and um, the future of finance and uh, inclusion uh, with finance. So we have common concerns, common grounds, um, and uh, this is what gives me hope for the future, but we need to work towards that. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, Stephen, if you can hear us, uh, we're curious also to hear a little bit more from you. Um, who are you, what do you do, and what's your takeaway from 2018? No? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, so like you said, my name is Steven uh, Maoto Um I'm speaking for Macra Ghana. Um, on this panel, I'm representing the African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation, um, a newly formed um, uh, NGO in Accra, Ghana. Um, aside, aside being the technical lead for African Open Data and Internet Research Society, I actually volunteer in a couple of organizations. Um, I'm on the panel for um, uh, Maps Ghana, um, Hot Foundation. That's how I'm currently I'm not able to be in France because um, I'm actually a trainer uh, on one of the programs that is happening currently uh, in, in, in Accra, Ghana, which is um, Open Cities Africa. Open Cities Africa currently is just aimed at 
making some of the cities in um, selected part of Africa resilient to um, flooding. So that's just one one uh, month take But from um, Open Data Africa, um, one of the things actually we believe from starting from Ghana is that we've had little awareness for for data. So one of the things as it is we took upon ourselves was to create a lot of data awareness using different technologies or emerging technologies that are actually available from um, from AI to um, IoT to embedded systems. So most of the 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 things as it is we try to actually facilitate nowadays was to see that most most of our data systems or most of the data that are actually um, generated in in this part of um, the world or Ghana to be specific since that's where it is I come from and stay most of um, my time in life is that we don't have most of our data has been um, open so one of the things as it is we are looking at is how best as it is can we educate people on how we can use the emerging technology what is um, blockchain technology to be able to make whatever data we want to be able to make available as much secured as possible as it is first it is um, we are having people to be able to connect and still having security um, at the at the at the back back of our mind um, about me personally I uh, I have an education in um, telecommunication engineering I've worked with a um, couple of um, telcos uh, before I actually resigned so when I saw the topic, it was one of my interests to see that I would want to see what it is um, the other world are actually thinking about or where it is this actually is being driven to. That's why I'm here today. Thank you so much. Uh, so Patrick, uh, a little bit more about you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Patrick. I'm a U.S. and EU public policy manager at ByteDance. Uh, if you don't know ByteDance, ByteDance is a content AI company. Uh, we have a portfolio of apps, uh, the one that you may be familiar with in Europe or the U.S. or uh, in Asia. Uh, used to be called Musical.ly, is now called TikTok. Uh, it's a short form, mobile native, uh, interest-based video product uh, with about 600 million monthly active users. Um, ByteDance, uh, like I said, is, is, a, is a content AI company and so we use this AI technology across video um, and across text-based news content. Uh, and we're really excited to be here. Um, so thanks, Sandra, for, for moderating and, and helping organize this. Um, a little bit about uh, the, the kind of key takeaway for 2018, just to keep it brief to, to get to the discussion. Um, I think what we're seeing is a lot of digital uh, platforms uh, and digital companies in general, whether they have platforms or not, are becoming much more aware of their responsibility when it comes to uh, building and fostering safer communities, safer online experiences, um, whether that comes to sharing uh, privacy and security best practices, uh, sharing you know what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and so forth, online behavior, uh, you know things like setting a strong password and that whole kind of slew of things. Um, we're seeing a lot more companies take this very seriously and understanding the responsibility um, that they play as a digital player uh, in the market um, and in this kind of digital connected world. So uh, that, that's kind of something that really uh, stood out to us in, in 2018. Um, we're, of course, really excited to be part of that. It's a, it's a huge opportunity. Um, and, uh, yeah. Thank you, Patrick. And I know you wanted to also focus on the positive uh, sides um, of digital technology, particularly in the context of uh, mobile technology and emerging technologies. Um, but second question, maybe right back to you, uh, would be what are two concerns that keep you awake at night? Uh, particularly in the context of leveraging the internet for societal, educational, and cu cultural purposes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the unique challenges from having a, a pretty substantially sized platform is that there's a lot of new users connecting to the internet um, or using uh, such uh, interest-based video platforms or just online platforms in general for the very first time. Um, or users that uh, are not new to the internet but maybe don't understand how to use such apps or how to protect themselves online and so forth. And so it really relates back to like a key theme that we've seen from 2018 about a lot of companies taking more proactive stance and, and doing, you know, you know, taking responsibility and so forth. But with that also comes a, a, a big challenge, right? Um, we, we've done a lot this year in terms of publishing safety center materials, uh, 
releasing more privacy and, and safety oriented uh, settings and, and controls and features within the app, uh, partnerships with NGOs and providing resources to users and so forth, and getting public awareness out there. But what keeps me up at night is that, you know, there's a lot of people, right, that these contents need to reach. And of course, there's always more that can be done to reach those. Um, and so that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty big challenge um, for us and really the whole industry to address. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Caroline, maybe what keeps you up at night? Two, two concerns, maybe. Yeah, and I think it's quite literal, because I think these are like big issues. So uh, I think this is a very interesting question and serious question. So um, I would think uh, about cybersecurity issues. So cyber attacks and hacking are actually um, very large issues, because we have more and more devices connected to us. So through our mobile phones, we have IoT, wearables. We also have toys, so for children. Um, and we have more and more data to be hacked and, um, or to be spied or just to be um, taken over and shut down. So um, this involves quite a lot of challenges. And in the meanwhile, we have a shortage of talent in cybersecurity. So this is a challenge uh, that we, we need to solve. And a second challenge would be manipulation. So that would be like for commercial purposes, for example. So um, fake videos or um, hackings, but also like um, targeted ads that have a very strong power uh, for mass manipulation. So this is something uh, we, are, we are like worried about. But at the same time, we saw that there are um, projects emerging to stabilize cyberspace. So uh, the concept of digital, digital peace, for example, is pretty interesting to me. Um, the idea is that we want to have peace and safe uh, cyberspace free from um, hacking, et cetera, or at least with fewer hackings. So um, we're working towards that. Thank you so much. Stephen, if you can still hear us, what are two concerns that keep you up at night? Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect, thank you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh. Um, the main one that actually is at the, at the back of most people's mind is actually hacking. Um, Hacking in the sense that uh, you being able to have whatever system or more data is being connected. And one of the main concerns is how secure those systems are, as it is you are allow allowing access to as many people as, as possible. But um, with me, general, generally, as much as it is, there is increase in technology, increase in access to internet. But we still have a huge amount of um, communities that are still not connected to mobile phone or the internet. And so one not being able to have access to that information as it is they, they require for either being education or for whatever research purpose as it is they want to be able to, to have. So one of the key things that has actually been at the back of my mind personally is how, how well, how best, or how cost effective is one able to um, transport technology to even the remotest parts of um, our communities so that they are able to also have access and connect to how much information or how, um, the abundance of information that is actually on the internet. Thank, Thank you. So yeah. And since we have you already on the line, and that's uh, quite complicated, it seems. I, I also have a third question for you that maybe you wouldn't mind answering. So the third question would be, what are two themes or areas of focus that you're looking forward to in 2019? So what gets you excited, or where are you optimistic? Um, it, it will still be the, the same 
um, connecting um, remote areas or rural areas so that we are able to use them for either for emergencies or for hospitals and education. Um, being able to have access on my platform that are able to connect people to that info that this um, we have for in Ghana um, currently the open data system um, is now gaining um, ways so we still have a huge chunk of data that is still not available to people that are actually looking for so you might be looking for information to be able to help you in a research as this one or to be able to um, advise you probably on a project you want to do but it might take you longer time to be able to actually get access to um, those days. Um, so one of the things actually as I'm looking for will be connectivity to um, the most remotest parts of um, um, or any other place. Um, how is, are they able to connect to the internet and also be able to have advantage of some of the resources as it is we who are not in the urban areas are having. Um, and then be able to make as much data open as possible. Thank you so much, Stephen. So Caroline, like, what gets you really excited? What are you optimistic about? And what are you going to work and tackle in 2019? So um, a few people in the room talked about um, uh, like AI for developing countries as well as uh, AI to tackle climate change, uh, which are immense issues. So I'm really excited to see what the technologies can do to help us tackle this. Um, and we are going to explore these topics um, in, uh, in Dubai for the, world, uh, the Global Governance of AI Roundtable at the World Government Summit. Um, so we're organizing this in cooperation with OECD, um, IEEE, and UNESCO. And uh, we are excited to, to, to see how we can enable these positive innovations for AI for good, for environmental um, positive innovations, for example. But um, we are also working to mitigate the ethical and safety risks. So that's the first area of focus, so um, this global cooperation. And the second area of cooperation that I'm, I'm really hopeful about is uh, the applications of AI and other emerging technologies that can foster more cooperation between the US and China so um, these are, for example, AI for mobility or um, AI for um, SDGs, etc. So uh, we are also going to organize an event in China. So uh, hopefully we'll have uh, Bai Dance with us. Um, and, uh, and we will explore uh, how to um, enable these changes and have this shared prosperity uh, for all. Thank you so much. And so last but not least, Patrick, uh, what gets you really excited about uh, and what are you going to focus on in 2019? Yeah, I think there's two main areas, uh, or there's actually many areas, the two areas I, that, I, that I touch upon. Um, the first being uh, building more tools that connect people better and that uh, help people discover really unique and interesting things about the world that they may not know. Um, so what I mean by that, you know, one example is uh, users discovering uh, hidden museums that are kind of like the gem, like beauty gems of uh, countries, um, especially in the developing world that have previously not seen uh, or received exposure on the global uh, stage. Um, this is a trend that we're already starting to see and something that we're quite excited to help continue um, foster and grow next year. Um, another area is building more tools that allow users to express themselves and to share their creativity and imagination. Um, the you know mobile phones are now getting so much more powerful really across the world um, and that you can do a lot of things with AR, VR, um, even AI in terms of music and, and effects and so forth um, on even pretty low-end devices actually and so that presents a fun opportunity uh, for users to uh, better express themselves and like I said use their creativity imagination um, and this is a really core value to us um, something we're excited about. Thank you so much to all three of you. So with this, we wanted to really make sure we have enough time also for questions, discussion, 
the broad two open questions would again be also to you. What are things you are particularly concerned about, maybe things you have observed over the course of this year, but also really what are things that excite you and that you are um, thinking of focusing on in 2019 um, or questions for my colleagues here on the panel? Anyone? I know it's, it's day three, but maybe it could also be an observation that you had from the last two days. Is there something you heard that maybe also surprised you that you said, now going home, this is something that really makes me optimistic and I'm going to continue to tackle it? Yes. And if you don't mind just quickly introducing yourself again, I'm supposed to remind people of that. Uh, hi, my name is Alvaro Crow. I'm from Colombia. And, well, I, I heard in these days, actually, uh, uh, like a really good idea about how to use um, IE in order to help in, <coughs> in, in environment, uh, help to the, the environment. And, and is that maybe there are forms to introduce i.e. in environment in in the information system of some enterprises that use um, <coughs> raw material and then manufacture it because uh, if you have the data of how many consumers or how many clients are, are going to purchase your products maybe that information is useful to uh, adapt your supply chain in order that you tell your suppliers how many material you need. So uh, I think that's a good idea because, well, if you know how the, the quantity of material that you have to manufacture, then you can help the environment producing less trash with, with, with the information you are receiving. And you can give satisfaction to your customers as, as well. So I think that's a good idea. Thank you so much. Any other one willing to share uh, a takeaway from the last two days or something that you're going to focus on for the next year that you're really excited about? Yes, please. Um, so my question is that um, you know the superior AI technology is being um, made in particular regions of the world by by certain corporations. So and I want to focus on AI for good, um, whether it's as you said accessing uh, knowledge like you know never before or uh, solving environmental issues. So how how so I. I I, I'm Shashan Mohan, I work in um, policy research and we defend digital rights back in New Delhi in India. Um, so my question is how do, how do we ensure that this, the benefits of AI technology is spread across the world and it's not concentrated in certain regions because if we, when we talk about AI for good, uh, we want to make sure that um, you know, it, it, it is for the global population at large. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know it's a, also a big question back, so maybe Caroline and then maybe Patrick if you have some additional thoughts. And Stephen, if you want to add at any point something, please just feel free to do so. Uh, yes, I think it's a very valid question, very important, because uh, the AI and emerging technologies market have a monopolistic tendency. Um, so to, to concentrate in the US, in China, or um, in Europe, or like a center, so that uh, these are um, very important issues, and that's why a lot of countries have uh, have released recently na national policies on AI. So, um, for example, France uh, released a, a policy recently. Um, but indeed, uh, India as well is working on becoming an AI garage to incubate um, AI projects for developing countries. But I think it's a it's a very important question. So I would say like national strategies need to, um, need to focus on areas of comparative advantage 
of uh, their countries. So um, that, that's probably a very important factor. And then a second factor that I think is, is really important for all countries is invest in talents. So talents are um, a scarce resource uh, for AI development. And uh, if you have it, if you develop it, uh, then you, you have more chance to catch up. And finally, I would say that there is a, a responsibility for uh, governments, international institutions, and corporations to, to find ways to share um, the benefits and the applications of AI. So there are different ways to do so. There are nonprofits that are working on this. AI for All is, a, is a, for example, a nonprofit uh, in the US working on, like, but uh, to, to teach women of colors how to code. But this kind of innovation, this kind of innovative uh, associations need to be um, scaled. And um, finally, like open access to uh, applications of AI um, would be a solution. Okay, um, I'm very excited by the fact that we are moving towards a world where we can depend on in, in, internet, internet you can trust. My main fears, obviously, are on intrusion, privacy, and personal space. I'm not sure how we can uh, do, how can, how can we avoid uh, interference with people's uh, confidentiality and privacy. Number two, as we do walk to ones depending on internet and trusting the digital technology, the question is, do we have safety measures that these <coughs> systems and technologies will not fail because if there's crash worldwide or even a country in a region, one day, we are people who don't know the real world sufficiently to be streetwise. Anyway, you want to walk, any medicine, medicine you want to do, any shopping you want to do is online. What do we do? Is there something you feel also particularly excited about? I, I hear your concerns and I share some, uh, many of them, but what gets you excited? What are you optimistic about? <coughs> is that. Um, we went to one bigger accessibility to digital uh, 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 wow, that we can depend more, more people got access to the technology and the digital capacity. I'm also very excited that the world is working towards uh, reliable uh, access. That is basically being able to rely on the, on the, on the, on the digital capacity. So those are good because basically we are saying we are moving everybody together from the village, from the towns, uh, from different parts of the world to become have a common platform which we can which becomes like almost a, a lifestyle. So that's very, very exciting. That's why we are trusting the uh, internet. But uh, the other fears at the back of my mind uh, can we really develop foolproof uh, internet? Thank you so much. Thank you, Shankawi from Morocco. Uh, I think that uh, when we uh, take in the, the, the growth development, we must focus on uh, in, this, in the first level in the, 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 this development. Now, on the other thing, because uh, we must develop some tools for uh, cybersecurity, uh, we have more risk to to, to do this, I think that we can we, we could continue with this risk with the, we, we could uh, continue development uh, in the first level uh, for uh, ensuring this growth and not uh, for uh, blocking uh, any constraint uh, uh, before starting development I think okay. yes please. Uh, I just, just something just popped into my mind, and is that, for, for instance, in the, 
there, there's a good thing in the news industry, and and it's that before uh, the reader of a newspaper was a passive consumer of, of news, and now as in newspapers started to change to web platforms, so well, is is that's now the business. So now. Uh, because of the consu of the consumer role changed it is now no no passive is is active so there there can be a, a, because mm. people now interact with the news and they don't just read them as as before so i think there's a, a good way to control fake news for instance because community can be aware of, of web web platforms and and i think that's another good opportunity for um for technology and innovation to well, to make things better, maybe. Thank you. I have a, a, a then, a, a, well, yes, please. Um, it's also on sharing your thoughts. Um, I thought it was really interesting in this technology today and the way that mobile internet can really disrupt things. Uh, it's also on the, um, on how much it actually disrupt. Uh, we say, oh, it's great, it's being connectivity and et cetera. Um, so I'm bringing a thought from another session um, about how it actually also can, in some ways, increase existing inequalities. Uh, for example, in some countries, when you bring in the Internet, you're like, well, more people are actually like, connected, it's great. But then you have this gender uh, question of are actually women having access to those new technologies and how can you actually change that? Um, and so you have those places where actually when people have more internet, it's actually the men in the families who have this phone and mostly women have, are not allowed to have them because it's too well dangerous for them to be in contact with other people and how do you control what they're going to do. Uh, so I think what's also super interesting in those questions is how can we scale up the new technologies, emerging technologies uh, to have this biggest implementation and to also bring people who are not connected uh, by the communities to actually empower themselves and take up uh, those new technologies as well. Thank you so much. And maybe back to my uh, fellow panelists here. How do you address questions around inequality in your daily work? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, with, uh, with our applications, um, it's, uh, I think with the application specific, it's less so an issue. It's more so an issue like, uh, you were mentioning about access to the device or the internet right in the first place. Um, for our platforms, uh, it is very much a, a community-based platform where, yes, you can post content publicly, but you can also post it privately. And I think that part is very important, especially in these areas where, like you were mentioning, um, perhaps there's uh, a fear of posting a certain type of content um, or uh, you don't want other people knowing that you're posting a certain type of content. Platforms do offer these tools, right? And so that's one way that this can be addressed. Um, I agree, though, that there's a bigger challenge, right, when before it even comes to application-specific, um, and that's something that also needs to be addressed. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, we have a few ways to tackle this. So um, first, within ourselves, um, I think, like, our team uh, wants to tackle is very committed to tackle in, uh, inequalities and two third over two third of our team is um, women is based on women that's already like pretty pretty uh, original in this industry um, but um, we are also working on all our meetings um, so we are we are organizing convenings and we are always focused on having gender equality and uh, geographic representation so um, this, is, uh, this is something we're working on. Uh, for example, at the, the meeting we're organizing in Dubai at the World Government Summit. So usually uh, it's really hard to have representatives from Africa or like Latin America or the Caribbean in these kind of instances. Or at least it should be more a focus to have a representation of these areas. So we are, we are tackling this by, by having them at the table. And the second way we are tackling these problems is, um, is by working on, because we know this is not enough. Like the problem is like we, we still have probably like, um, like the heads of the leaders 
of these countries and not like a whole a full representation. This is just a process that is starting, uh, but we are very aware of this. And, um, and the second way to tackle this is to actually work on research uh, on these topics. So we are working um, with uh, Harvard students uh, on a project uh, in collaboration with the World Bank on uh, AI and digital innovation for developing countries. So like how to develop a framework that can be applied to developing countries um, so that they are empowered. Um, so this is a beginning, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's such an interesting topic and uh, we, we should like be talking about it more with empowerment and like uh, local initiatives about, about these topics. Really just a follow-up remark on, I think it's great that things are actually already thought about it, and it's not just about access actually uh, to the technology itself, uh, there's also all the questions about uh, how safe you feel uh, also online, because there's a lot of cyber bullying, especially against women or LGBT communities, uh, minorities generally, uh, so it's the question is how do you make sure that the content is not threatening and that people also feel connected, that the local content also addresses their problems, and then there's a question of algorithms who put forward some views of the word against others. Uh, for example, there has been also said recently that on YouTube some videos from women were less shown because they were women. And then there's the question about TikTok, for example, as well, where there's a question of how much it's actually a good uh, model for, for example, some kids because you have some really small girl who would actually do really sexualizing things. And then the question is how do you feel like this? What does it bring as a, an image? Uh, to you when you are really young and exposed to things. So there's a lot to do on AI and algorithms on that too. Yeah. Uh, I think an important part of that uh, in terms of the content, right, like you were saying, like what is acceptable and tolerable um, and not only, right, black and white, but really what does the culture expect, right, and what do the people wish to see and wish not to see in the various countries and markets around the world. Um, we think the only way to really address this uh, accurately, right, is to have a very localized approach when it comes to moderation, for example, and really understanding and respecting the norms that might take place in these places around the world that, you know, we in our position may not understand um, from the start, right? Um, and so this is something that we're doing. Uh, we have moderation in many countries around the world um, and working with, you know, uh, advisors and so forth to understand this, um, and that's helped a lot in, in regards to that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, and thank you also to the panelists for the talk. Um, just wanted to stress a previous uh, question on uh, data privacy and data concern, especially because AI is uh, the elaboration of a huge amount of uh, personal data that are fed in the algorithm. So my question maybe to, to you is um, how how does a company like uh, uh, Databyte um, respect or is uh, ensures that uh, those pr personal data are not, are not misused um, in various reasons that over the course of these three days, I think we, we, have, um, we really ref reflected upon how data can be used in order to profile against certain individual or um, just with theft, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think an important part of that is uh, transparency, right? Um, and educating uh, users uh, about what's happening um, when they use the app. And so this is one thing that we're taking very seriously when it comes to privacy policies, for example, and really clearly outlaying uh, what we do when you create an account, what we do when you post content and so forth. But then furthermore, giving you the options to uh, control uh, how your content is used, right? Um, and so I think those two things is really the, 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 the kind of gut of it. Um, but you're right. I mean, in general, right, the Internet, there's a lot of platforms um, that do use your data in ways um, that you don't know. And how to address this kind of at an international level um, is, a, is a really interesting conversation. Yeah. Hi, Connor Sanchez. Uh, thank you guys once again for, uh, for talking with us today. I guess a follow-up question on the privacy. I'm just, in, in terms of uh, the regulatory frameworks that you all operate in, uh, they seem to be, I mean, they're changing, um, you know, as we speak, and over the last year, the implementation of GDPR. I'm interested in um, just how you, how 
you've been affected by certain regulatory frameworks and how you're anticipating future changes to that and um, how that's impacted your work? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, you know, specifically the, the GDPR, right, um, a lot of the principles, if not most of the principles in the GDPR have actually been around for quite some time, right? The GDPR um, in many ways is a, is a repackaging of what has existed plus uh, more information about how to address certain topics, right? Um, so for a lot of this, um, it's nothing new to us. It's the same principles that we've stood by for a long time. Um, I think what GDPR uh, brought that wasn't brought before was this kind of mass awareness to the public, right, about uh, what you should expect from internet companies um, and, and so forth. Um, and so a lot of what we've done is kind of respond to that, right, and say, okay, uh, you know, make it more obvious, right, to the users about certain uh, privacy settings and safety settings and data settings and so forth. Um, so in terms of effect, uh, I would say that that's the biggest thing that, you know, that we've done in response. Yeah. Oh, yes, Andres Lombana talking here. Uh, just to follow up uh, what you were describing, Carolina, about this framework for the developing countries uh, of AI that y your, your uh, project is developing, um, I wonder how the data uh, aspect fits here, especially in relation to data governance and like how this framework is actually empowering these countries or, or these cities around the world that are like perhaps uh, that are lacking the infrastructure for processing data or for storing data. Uh, and how these uh, places of the world can actually take advantage of AI, uh, even if they lack the infrastructure, the infrastructure, what kind of governance or cooperations, for instance, with the de developing world can be established so it's fair and justice, uh, it's just to, uh, to, to, uh, to deploy these kind of AI technologies. So um, is, your take, is your question more about the infrastructure that is necessary or like the framework, the regulatory framework? Uh, I, I would say, uh, um, you have to wait until it's read uh, now. I would say both. Uh, I, I was just curious about the framework that you, your company is developing and uh, how it fits both infrastructure and, and regulator, regulations, yeah. Right, so that's an amazing question and that's what we are working on. Um, so we are, we're working on um, enabling industry, um, both like physical infrastructures that are necessary to, to gather data um, and are, that are costly, um, that are sometimes like, that are like sometimes environmental costs as well, so we need to, be, to make them also like environmental friendly. Um, so uh, this, this is something we're exploring. So, uh, this can be done through cooperation with international entities as well as um, with uh, corporations. So Google and um, other, con other, other corporations um, are actually cooperating with uh, countries uh, based in developing uh, places like uh, in the global south uh, to say um, to build these infrastructures but it cannot be done only with um, big corporations. It needs to be an international effort uh, to share prosperity. Um, so this is for the infrastructure, like the physical ones, and then for the, for the framework. It's still um, at, the, at the stage of, um, of research, um, but we have a few ideas for that. Um, and, um, we are working on it, but it's it's still in the in the making. But let's keep in touch because um, we will be releasing this with the World Bank soon. Uh, but I will keep you in touch. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from the online community? No, no, it's not so far. So yes, yeah, yes, Urs. This Urs, um, I have a question for the panelists and, and thanks for, for mapping out some of the opportunities as well as the challenges and everyone who contributed uh, from the audience as well. Um, my question is, the, the, the beginning of the panel discussion really, what has happened in 2018, what are we excited about or what's going, what are trends for 2019, I think is an excellent framing and I'm just wondering how can we actually track progress? We identified some key challenges, whether it's you know, connectivity or, or literacy at 
the physical layer or the content layer. There are lots of things we need to work on. But how can we track our progress? How do we measure it, um, especially in a you know, kind of diverse global environment where we have so many relevant players, as you pointed out, many different stakeholders working on many of these things in parallel? How can we become better in somehow um, uh, developing metrics that, that help us also to, to organize ourselves and to strengthen collaboration? Um, how do we do that? And uh, one would think, you know, in the age of big data, we can improve also on, on our metrics and measurements uh, across both challenges and opportunities. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, something that I see a lot, and, and you kind of alluded to this, is a lot of players, right, in the industry, whether they be private or public or whatever they may be, are doing efforts, but a lot of them are doing them very individually, right? Um, company A is doing this, company B is doing this, NGO A is doing this. Um, I think what, 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 what needs to happen, um, and, and we also see this in the nonprofit, like the NGO space, right? So many NGOs, um, which is really great, um, but there's opportunity for collaboration. Um, and so working more closely with uh, leaders in, uh, you know, the local market or wherever it might be, and partnering with them and enabling them uh, is a perhaps a more scalable approach um, than everyone trying to do similar things in the same space. Um, and that would also enable better uh, collecting of data and measurements and improvements and tracking progress over time um, because there is uh, one or at least, uh, you know, there will never be one, right, but a lesser number of uh, 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 kind of experts and NGOs and leaders involved uh, in that particular issue. Um, that seems um, um, a great idea, and that we need to, to work on that to assess impact and to see uh, whether we are advancing or not. Um, so, um, a few things come in mind uh, when, with regards to what is already being done. So, um, the AI Now Institute at NYU is working on um, um, a way to measure um, algorithmic biases and to, notably for public organizations. So, um, it's called algorithmic impact um, measurement, um, or like a similar wording. And this is already like a good way to measure these kind of ethical problems and progress. Um, and a few, a few labels are, are emerging. They are still in the making for AI and ethics and transparency. Um, so we need to improve and work on them. And I think um, the environmental sector gives us a lot of possibilities um, to, to, to have inspiration. So there are a lot of environmental um, measurements, um, like the, the compacts, the, um, the global compacts, for example, are a way of measuring very different aspects of environmental progress, so biodiversity, water, um, energy saving, etc. So if we could have a similar label, similar ways of advancing uh, for, for companies, that would be very interesting. Um, so to work towards um, a, a world where we have incentives to, to be better and we have reputation costs if we are not making progress. That seems like a, like a soft law approach that is um, necessary and interesting to explore. Stephen, in case you're still here, um, the question was how do we track or measure progress? Um, if you have thoughts on that or otherwise maybe last question very quick for our panelists would be from my side, what do you wish, and I mean we we're, we're really wanted to also focus on the positive sides and positive applications, what's one area that you feel hopeful and optimistic about, but you can't tackle yourself, and you wish our colleagues here in the room uh, might address uh, moving forward. And Stephen, if you can hear us at any point, feel free to speak up. Hello. Perfect. Stephen, so how do we measure and track progress? Okay, um, I think um, Caroline and um, Patrick, if I got the names right, are doing um, excellent well. I think they're they are answering the questions as it is, they are, they are coming perfectly. Um, but in, in Ghana, one of the, the things as it is, 
uh, Patrick was saying is that we're having different organizations that are doing their, their thing. Um, in Ghana as well, we've noticed that because we've realized that we've had different people that are trying to solve the same problem, like absolutely. So um, we don't even really know how best as it is, how far it is one person is going. So what it is, um, um, UNDP in collaboration with some of the organizations have done now bring all those organizations on post angels under one umbrella and let it where it is are we trying to go, where it is are we trying now. And so currently like to even look at um, one of them open data platforms. They are now trying to collaborate with World Bank and um, most of the other organizations that are trying to solve the, um, the same goal, the same agenda. So that tomorrow when somebody says he wants or be we know that this is where the driving force is actually um, driving towards. Apart from um, trying to now do the same thing, there's no way we are able to track um, what is going on. Unless otherwise there is a policy that is actually laid down that's okay. This is where um, a country choosing to actually go. But apart from that, like as this um, Patrick is saying, it is um, a group of people, a group of organizations coming together to actually drive the same force, have the same um, 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 uni unified that they actually talk together so that uh, irrespective of where person A or person B is, can actually really know where a cause is being driven over. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so maybe uh, since we're already uh, at time, maybe a mini tweet length, what do you hope others would focus on that you yourself can know? Okay, uh, understanding more AI policy in China to build more trust and understanding. And uh, there is a newsletter that I recommend is by Jeff Redding uh, of Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. So Jeff Redding newsletter on AI and it has translations um, from Chinese news. And I'll just quickly say, um, I think in one word it's education. Um, and we, you know, we think education um, uh, in the context of the developing world, right? But it's really also a challenge in the developed world. Um, you know, regardless of age, regardless of uh, what devices you have and have access to and, and, and so forth, um, there's always more that you can learn about making yourself safe and using technologies uh, better. Um, so, so I would sum it up in, in education. Yeah. Thank you so much. Stephen, if you can still hear us, what's one thing you wish uh, the people here in the audience would focus on next year that you can't yourself? Well, maybe you can share it via, via tweet uh, with us uh, using the hashtag IGF2018. Um, Okay, so uh, thank you so, so, so much for staying with us for this hour, um, day three of IGF. So I'm, we are deeply grateful that you all came uh, to this session and contributed to it. So again, thank you from my side uh, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much.